Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday. It's been a great week so far. Um, those of you that follow my uh, my newsletters, you may have seen that I did send out a bit of a warning yesterday. Um, so just have a look at that. Now, as you know, I do a lot of what I, what I see as far as risks or um, strategies that will benefit service, any, anything like that. I send that through the emails, which is predominantly speaking with the proof providers. So I did send a warning yesterday. There are a couple of practices that... Um, have come to my attention. So I've just wanted to highlight those risks to people. And as you also know, I take that information and transfer that over to the YouTube channel for educators so that you guys can be safe also. So today we are talking about CCS practices in family daycare and what that means for you guys. So welcome. And again, happy Saturday. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen and a lot of that is to keep me on track also so that I don't forget to tell you anything. Okay. So CCS administration in family daycare. So one of the things that I really need to be clear about and one of the things that I can see the frustration from the federal regulatory officers or the federal regulatory department is the fact that the, the service agreement, <coughs> pardon me, sits with the approved provider and the federal regulatory officer, which is Department of Education, Skills and Employment. So that's where the service agreement sits. The service agreement doesn't sit, the CCS administration service agreement does not sit with the family daycare educators. So I get a lot of questions from family daycare educators around what can they do about um, a particular late fee or what can they do about charging families that don't show up or what can they do about applying this fee or how can they work out if they only want to do shorter days, those sorts of things. And yes, you can do that and I'm going to get to that in a second. But ultimately, and as I advise to everybody that asks those kinds of questions, you've got to go through your service provider firstly anyway because it's the service provider that sets the fee schedule of what you can charge, what you can't charge, how much that is, when that starts, when that finishes, all those sorts of things sit with your service provider. So that's why it's really important if you are shopping around for a new service provider that you have all of the right questions so that you can ask your new service provider what that is and what that means for you, okay? All right. Oh, gee, I'll tell you. Why is it not? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me firstly. Um, so my name is Jodie Signorino and I'm a governance and leadership advisor and I've worked in the sector for over 30 years. Um, I've worked in leadership and governance for 16 years now, almost 16 years. I established JPS Advisors back in 2014 and I focused on family daycare um, because I could see that there were a number of risks to educators and I wanted to help approve providers, make sure that the governance, I am very passionate about governance and I am very passionate about early childhood. I do hold early childhood qualifications. I hold human services qualifications and I'm also part the way through a master's. Um, I live in Melbourne oh, and I hold training qualifications. I live in Melbourne with my family and... Um, yeah, I focus on family daycare, although I do do a number of projects for different service types, including long daycare and out of school hours. Okay, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owner, the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you. My other reminder getting going today is make sure you jump onto the YouTube channel and subscribe and make sure you turn on your notifications because every Saturday is a different training. And as you see, I do operate on my feet a lot of the time. So the training isn't always planned in advance. So today's training came at short notice purely because of the experiences that I've had with a couple of approved providers this week that have highlighted some risks in the sector. Okay, today we are going to cover what am I telling the approved provider so that you know what is the governance information that they are receiving as far as meeting their legal obligations under the family assistance legislation. I'm also going to cover off a couple of the, the big risks that we see with that CCS administration. And I'm going to give you some strategies to make sure that you're safe and you know how to choose a reputable provider that's got sound practices in place. Okay, so as I said, 
The service agreement between the federal regulatory authority, now you've got to remember, and, and you may have seen last week's one around the different obligations, the state regulatory authorities, they're, they're, the purpose of that legislation is to protect children from harm and hazards at all times. With the federal regular, with the federal regulatory authority, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, the, the purpose of that legislation is, is to essentially protect taxpayers' money from harm and hazards. So we know that in family daycare, there has been a history of fraud. We know that there still are gaps in the process which can um, make fraud easier or make it easier for families and educators to collude, for mistakes to happen. So we know that family daycare in particular is at risk as opposed to other service types, purely based on the model and what that looks like under the family assistance legislation. Now, remember, you are the family daycare educators and you are in agreement with the service provider. Every service looks different. Every service use, has a different fee schedule. Every service has maybe a different third-party software. Some may be on Harmony, some may be on Hubwork, some may be on Owner, some may not use a, a third-party software. So the way that each service manages their accounts and those sorts of things, particularly in relation to the CCS, does vary across the board. So what I'm going to talk to you about is how you can how you can identify whether there are some gaps or there are some risks that that you may be operating because of the service that you're provide that you're registered with that you may be operating against the family assistance legislation and I want to keep you safe so that's the part of the that that's the reason why I do this so remember service agreement between the department and the service to administer childcare subsidy and you have a contract agreement between yourself as the family daycare educator working under your ABN and the service provider. Neither two shall meet, so to speak. Okay. Now, if you don't know, you don't know. Some of the risks that I've seen coming up over the past couple of weeks actually relate to longer term, like longer op services that have been in operation for a longer time. So what happened was there's been some practices that happened in the past and, and they've just continued to go that way. So now when the federal government are looking at the service providers' accounts or CCS claims or how their what their practices are as far as making sure that all the CCS, you know, is valid and meets and it's reconciled and all those sorts of things. Um, if you do have outdated practices, you may not be aware that it's just a practice that has happened forever and the current expectation is that that should change or go or be further risk assessed. So I'm not telling anybody to change anything at all at this point, but it is definitely noteworthy to have a look. So the risks to CCS administration, um, if it's not done correctly, is educators lose out on income. And I hate that I see that so much, that are, you know, educators are saying, you know, this family's left and I've missed out on the last two weeks of fees or um, this family's always late and I never know what to do with this family or this family never provide food, I end up doing that or the service provider told me this, I charge so, I, I pay X amount of levy to the service provider and I don't really I can't really see what I'm getting in return they just turn up every month and and that's really it so it really is about making sure that you can recognize what quality service providers are also and what service providers should be offering you to make sure you're safe the other risk is if and it does happen if the federal regulatory officers do an audit on a service provider and there are um, reasons or there are discrepancies or there are patterns, um, then the federal, the federal government will take an audit of that and the potential risks to that are suspension. So a CCS approval can be suspended or a CCS approval can be cancelled. Now, we all know what that means. If a service provider CCS is um, cancelled, then you guys being educators, you're pretty much out on your own virtually immediately and families would be scrambling for care also. Um, if there is a debt, so in many cases, once an audit is conducted with um, for a service provider, the federal regulatory officers, once, that, once that's all over and done with, which can take days, weeks or months even, um, the service provider will get a letter of debt and they will say, you owe the federal government X amount of dollars. Now, if you work with a service provider that um, has to recover some debt, 
then depending on the debt, depending on why that happened, depending on a range of things that I really can't go into now, but they may come back to educators and try to recoup some of that loss. So it can and it does happen. So that's why I want you to be sure about all this sort of stuff, okay? Now, when it comes to setting fees, as I said, that is around the service. The service holds that obligation as part of the service agreement to set all the fees and the fee schedule, what they are going to be, whether it's fair and equitable across all families, those sorts of things. But what you can do is you've got to do a cost analysis to have a look at how much does your working at home in your family daycare program, how much does that cost you? So you've got to factor everything in. You've got to factor in your mortgage, your gas, your electricity, your insurances, your car, your maintenance of the car, um, your consumables, arts, crafts, foods, nappies. Um, what kind of profit do you want? What is the wage that you're looking for? What is the wage you appropriately should be getting? And how does that, how can, what is the profit that you need to add to that? What are the costings that you need to add to that? Um, so knowing where you sit from a rate perspective. So if you change that language from as the family daycare educator setting fees to the family daycare educator setting rates, that actually does help make that distinction under the obligations under the family assistance legislation. So that's just a little tip. So one of the things I talk about a lot, and I do talk about this a lot with educators, is making sure that you've got a, a budget in place that will um, identify all of your costs, particularly any hidden costs. And the example that I use for hidden costs is often um, celebrations. You may do five, six celebrations a year, and that's not costed in over that course of the year. So those five, six um, celebrations, they're, they're cutting into your profit so that you're not, you know, your money's not balancing out as much as you think it should be. Um, the business of a family daycare educator course does have a, a spreadsheet in it, but I just wanted to go through this with you. So a spreadsheet is something along the lines like this. So you've got all of your, I don't, I don't know whether you can see my thing. Um, you've got all of your, your cost items down here, any income that you make, which would be fees. Now this is probably set on an approved provider one, but you may have another stream of income, whether that be you might, um, I don't know, you might, I don't know, offer tutoring or I don't know, I don't know. You might have something different that, that constitutes a, a different income stream, what that is. Uh, any investment that you've made. So again, when I speak with educators, you know, and I'm asked that question, how much does it cost to start a family daycare educator business from home? Well, again, how much is a piece of string? Do you need new fencing? What kind of resources do you need? What do you already have? Um, how big is your home? How many children can you cater for? So it really does depend on individual circumstances. Um, but this cash flow projection by developing one of these or, or getting my one, this will help you punch in and all these little red dots mean something if you're not an Excel user. Um, by putting in all of your figures so that you can determine what it is exactly that you'll be generating, making, profiting, expenses, what you can cut costs on, what you can't cut costs on, any capital growth. Like I speak to family daycare educators all the time, if you want a climbing frame or a sand pit built in the yard, you know, how much is that going to cost? Are you going to move, um, put money aside for that every month or fortnight or those sorts of things? Um, so this is really important about your costing so that you know what your rates need to be when you negotiate with an approved provider. Um, now, getting in touch. If you do need to get in touch. Now, I'm going to tell you why I've put this here today because often, the, as I said, the service agreement around administering the childcare subsidy is between the service provider and the family. So that means in reality, like if I'm a family member that comes and drops my child off in your care, there's only certain conversations and, and certain things that we can even decide or agree or talk about because it's not up to the family daycare educator to set the fees. It's not up to the family daycare educator to make any fee decisions. Um, and if a family wants to change any of their bookings or enrolments, that technically should go through the service provider. Um, getting money, what, what happens around taking cash? Now, I know that some educators are still taking cash and that is putting you at risk in the sense that I'm your family member. I come in, I, I owe you $45. There's my $45, educator. Thank you very much. 
and then you pop it down and it, your partner may come and go, oh, $45, I'm going to go to Safeway anyway and take that $45. It may get forgotten. Um, so there are risks to that. There's also risks to saying, um, you may say to a family member, don't forget you owe me $45. And I say, well, I paid you $45 last week. Don't you remember that I did that? And you're like, oh, no, did I forget? Did I not forget? So there are risks to, to handling cash. And if you do take cash and you do write a receipt there and then, how is that acquitted for the service provider so that the service provider can go back and verify that that cash was taken? Under the family assistance legislation with the child care uh, subsidy administration rules, um, the families are liable for a legitimate payment. So they have to pay their gap fee. And that gap fee has to be verified and, and verified by the service provider to prove to the regulatory authority that that has gone through. I also know there are some educators that are taking direct debit deposits from families. So if I am a family, I owe $45, that's great. I transfer that $45 directly from my bank account to your bank account every Thursday or whatever that is. Now, if the service provider can't access that bank account or verify that bank account, and we see some practices like the coordinator will come for a spot visit and they'll say, oh, can you please log into your bank account so that I can see what that is and, and you log in and do that. So there are risks to that in the sense that, number one, the coordinator is easily distracted while doing a, a spot visit. They can't spend all day reconciling a bank account. So sometimes payments can get missed and they might not look at it long enough over your phone or whatever it is device you're, you're signed in on. Um, they may not be able to go back further. So they might see one payment, but they haven't seen the payment the previous month. So therefore that potentially is a missing payment. Um, so they're probably the two biggest risks. And, and depending on where parents pay their accounts to, if that's your and your family's bank account, you, know, you don't want the service provider to have access to that account. So do you set up a different account? So what is that? Remember that it is the service provider's responsibility to reconcile an account for all transactions that relate to the operation of an education and care service, which is approved for the, for the CCS, okay? So I hope all that makes sense. If you do feel that you are at risk or if you are doing something that you possibly shouldn't be doing, I know you guys get left with a lot of the chasing up of the fees and the loss of money and trying to work out how you can make better ends meet. I know that so many of you don't feel very supported. Um, so that's why knowledge is power, so to speak. So that's why by understanding the legislation, you can get a better idea of whether or not you are with the right provider, what you should be expecting for your levy and how the CCS is administered. So if there are, if you've got an approved provider that is putting responsibility back on you, on you that technically should be theirs, then that is a service that we would consider at risk of losing their CCS at some stage, their approval at some stage, whether that be a sanction or a cancellation. Um, so if you do need to get in touch, if you've got any questions, please feel free. There's the contact button there. Um, and it will just take you here where you can either subscribe to the newsletter or you can pop your question in here and I can um, give you any information or support that I can. Um, I am going to pop in the link here for the free business plan template, which will help you work on those cash flow projections that we've talked about. <coughs> and I will also pop the link into the Department of Education, Skills and Employment. And there's a lot of information on there including the child care provider handbook around what that should look like. And if you read that, you will see that the responsibility lies with the approved provider. Yes, they can delegate um, things over to educators, coordinators. They're in there. That's absolutely okay for them to do that. But it's how if they delegate any responsibility over to you, are they able to go back and verify any of those transactions, payments, changes, any of those sorts of things? And it's where we see those gaps, like a missing payment or anything like that, that that, that is a risk. So if that service were to be audited, and you never know if you're going to be audited by the federal regulatory authority, because that's all a desktop audit. So you never know when they're going to have a look really closely at any claims that have gone through the service. Okay, so that's just about making sure that you that you are safe in your financial practices between yourself and the approved provider that you're registered with. 
Um, so yeah, just making sure that everybody's good. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's actually quite sunny right now. So the sun's out. So all good. Um, keep your eye on the newsletter if you don't already. And you can subscribe to the newsletter via um, the website. Easy enough to do. Um, yeah, if you ever need anything or if you feel that um, you're not safe in your financial practices or you don't know all of your costs or anything like that, feel free to drop me a line. I can do a video around that if you've got anything in particular or anything that you like. I um, And I was in conversations last night with an educator until late last night, actually, um, who wanted to speak about isolation. So we'll put some networking and some um some ways to, to I suppose, um, deal with isolation in family daycare as a family daycare educator and strategies that you can use to help you feel a little bit more connected with your wider community and your family daycare educator community. So I will be looking at that. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, as I said, and I will see you here next Saturday at 11 o'clock. See ya. Bye.